Good evening and welcome to the school committee meeting of February 25th, 2016. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and I am presiding this evening. Uh, we'll begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll of the Northampton School Committee. Mr. Thomas Baird? Here. Ms. Molly Burton? Here. Ms. Rebecca Bizanti? Here. Ms. Kathy Lawrence? Here. Ms. Jennifer Bowen? Here. Ms. Jennifer Bowen? Here. Ms. Present. Ms. Mr. Howard Moore? Here. Mr. Nettie? Here. Mr. Edsel Present. And Mayor David Narkowitz? Present. Your Honor, you have a point. Excellent. Um, we do have public comment on this evening's uh, agenda. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak? Okay, seeing none. Um, the primary purpose, oh, actually, any announcements from the school committee? I'm sorry. Oh, Ms. Fallon. Um, there are two events being hosted um, over this next month uh, by organizations that do so much to support the Northampton Public Schools. The first is um, Vins, the volunteers in Northampton schools, will have their annual Not Your Typical Dog show on Saturday, March 5th at Northampton High School Gym between 12 and 3 p.m. And the Northampton Education Foundation Spelling Bee will be March 30th at the JFK Middle School. Um, dinner served at 5 and the bee begins at 6. Um, if you get your payment in by February 26th, um, you're guaranteed inclusion of the sponsor's name on the event poster, but um, they will accept registrations up until March so I hope everyone will attend, get involved, and uh, we thank them so much for their support. <coughs> Any other announcements? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the, uh, to the primary uh, part of our agenda tonight. Um, and this is a presentation by uh, Dr. Provost of the first view of uh, fiscal year 2017 budget. Um, uh, Dr. Provost will lead this from the podium, and I'm going to move out of the r range of fire of the PowerPoint. And um, I guess I'll ask Dr. Provost to sort of direct and answer questions um, uh, as if people have them as he moves through. So, begin by asking you all to take a minute just to study the faces of these children. Can you see in them a student you might know? Can you imagine what they might be thinking? These kids have been staring at me from my computer screen for about a month as I've been working on this presentation. and. I think I've begun to uh, understand what they're saying. What they say to me is, we're watching you. Will you be making the right decisions for us? Um, you'll be seeing a lot of them tonight as we go through the slides, and I'd like you to um, keep thinking about those questions. Um, as, as you consider the many proposals that I have for you tonight, um, think about these guys, and um, please, check to make sure that we're making the right decisions for them. Let me start by talking about the process that brings us here. Uh, actually, the, we started not in 2015, we started in 2016 um, with reviewing the information from 2015 as an alt team, um, updating our, our building profiles and our cost center profiles, taking a look at the trends as we could see them in spending in fiscal 16 and beginning to take a look at the needs as we thought they might appear in 2017. Um, the, the guiding document for our budget decisions, as with everything in the district, was the district improvement plan. There are two specific parts of the district improvement plan that were very relevant to our budget considerations this year. The first was providing teachers with an effective RTI program. Um, you'll see some budget proposals that are related to the RTI program. And the second um, goal from the, the district improvement plan is to ensure resource equity. Um, after we had an opportunity to discuss this over several meetings as an ALT team, I had an opportunity, which is new this year, 
which was part of um, our DIP implementation, um, to review this budget in a way that I've never been able to before, in a way that I think adds a lot of value to the proposals tonight by sharing this with our DIP implementation committee. Um, at that point, it was in a much more conceptual um, perspective, but our DIP implementation committee is a joint labor management group that works on ensuring that all the goals of the DIP are faithfully implemented in the school. And so it provided me with a good opportunity to get some feedback from teachers and other people who are not normally um, privy to early versions of the budget um, to get a sense of what they thought about our budget needs. So in a sense, um, you're getting proposals that have been vetted to a certain extent by administrators and by teachers. Um, then the first view uh, budget in a, a format very similar to this was reviewed and examined by the Budget and Property Subcommittee um, last week. And tonight's goal is to get a sense of the committee um, as to whether or not you think the proposals contained herein are sensible. Um, if, you, if you're in agreement, um, we'll be able to begin the process of converting this 30 slide presentation to several hundred page detailed budget books. Um, if you think we're headed in, in the wrong direction, um, then I'll have an opportunity to, to regroup with my team and with the budget and property subcommittee um, to work on some other proposals. Um, this document also um, is the first time the FY17 budget proposals are being reviewed or revealed to the public. So they provide an opportunity for public comment to begin. Um, my goal would be this year, as was the case last year, um, to um, keep a running <coughs> record, if you will, of public comments we receive on the proposals and to be able to provide feedback to you and feedback for the public at the next budget meeting on what the public at large thinks of what's included in here. But before I move on, you know, I'd really like to just acknowledge the ALT team, many of you, many of whom are assembled here before you tonight um, for their work on getting the budget to this point. I'd also like to thank Julie for um, her work in bringing together the DIP implementation committee to allow me to get some feedback in a way that I think is kind of unique in the way district budgets are usually developed. So, before we uh, move too far into the document, uh, I'd like to provide some context that sort of um, underlies many of the proposals that are made. Um, and this is some information that comes to us from the new economic disadvantage indicator or metric that we have in the district. Um, We've had much discussion at the committee level about what the change from free and reduced lunch to economic disadvantage would mean for district funding. I think the impact is nothing. Um, but one of the things that um, is new in this metric is it allows us to see where the district appears in terms of deciles of need across the state. Um, so this is from uh, governor's budget proposal. <coughs> And one, one of the things that the department has been able to do based on the economic disadvantage indicator is identify what the deciles of need are throughout the state. So you can see that Northampton Public Schools is in the sixth decile of need. Um, that's the decile that covers the range from 25% to 28% economic disadvantage, um, which I thought was kind of surprising to me. I mean, it means we're in the top half of poverty in the state. Um, obviously, the difference between the extent of poverty in the sixth decile is quite a bit different from the extent of poverty in the tenth decile, but um, I, thought that was, I thought that was interesting. Um, one thing we can do also although I do this with a little bit of caution because the deciles were created on the basis of district data, is just sort of see where would the schools fit within that, those ranges that have been developed statewide. Um, so you can see our lowest need school is Northampton High, which would fall within the third decile. 
Leeds and JFK are sort of right at the middle at statewide average. They're in the fifth decile. And then Bridge, Jackson, and Ryan Road all line up very close to each other in the seventh decile. So um, we've talked many times from the beginning of the entry findings, um, and I'm sure will for many years, about sort of the differences that exist within schools and the need to look at schools individually. I think this um, is another way of really highlighting that. I think it's unique to have a district where you have one school that's in the bottom 30% of need and three schools that are in the top 40% of need. Um, and so this brings me to uh, a document that I think is still used in school committee training. I know it was one time anyways, called the Conditions of School Effectiveness. Um, item number 11, as I recall, in Conditions of School Effectiveness is called Strategic Use of Resources. And one of the indicators under there is students from high need subgroups are a priority when budget and resource allocations are made. Um, so based upon this finding and the conditions of school effectiveness, I would submit that um, if we're doing the right thing for kids, we'd be trying to direct as much as we can in this budget to those schools that are presenting with the highest need. So um, sort of <coughs> operationalizing those, those broad goals from the district improvement plan to things that um, are really actionable for this year's budget. We uh, came up with six goals. The first is to increase opportunity for learning. Second, support students' emotional <coughs> health. Third, put resources to the highest use. Fourth, enhance STEM education. Fifth, increase equity and pay fairly. And sixth, uh, it's sort of overarching and I think everlasting goal, if you will, to extend st stability and sustainability within the budget process. So the next part of the presentation will go into each of those goals in greater detail. We begin um, as we did last year, and it's the only way I really know how to, to rationally build a budget by figuring out what a level service budget would be. What I mean by level service is just rolling the current configuration of the district forward from the current year to the next year without making any changes whatsoever. Um, and so then people uh, talk about fixed cost increases. Those are really the costs that would be needed to maintain the district as it currently exists um, without any change. So the largest of these is always salaries. Um, salary increases for next year are $840,089. That includes steps, lanes, seniority, awards, and the 1.5025% COLA that becomes effective this June 30th. Special Ed contract services is the next highest um, increase. That's $234,000. Um, you'll notice that nowhere in this list is special education out of district tuitions. That's one of the things that usually is on this list of um, fixed cost increases. But we don't really have an increase there in this budget. Um, one of the impacts of that is you have an increase in special ed contract services. If we're keeping, if we're doing a good job about serving students with disabilities in their home school, keeping them included, um, it means that we have to bring some specialty services into the district to help them be successful. Another part of this is there's been a recharacterization on how some out of district um, charges appear. So some of the special ed contract services are actually services that in prior years were listed as um, out of district tuition. So those are two things driving that number. Um, miscellaneous general education um, is a number of accounts that you know really defies description, but that's hundred and thirteen thousand eight hundred and fifty six dollars then we have contractual increases in general ed transportation and special ed transportation thirty seven thousand two hundred ninety seven and twenty four thousand seven hundred and fifty seven Medicaid billing um, we've talked about in 
several, several meetings before, but I'll just mention again, this is the premium that we pay for processing Medicaid billing. Um, in special education primarily, but also in some other areas of the school program, the district provides Medicaid billable medical services for students. There is a process by which the municipality can recapture some of the um, costs for Medicaid eligible children um, for medical services provided in the schools. But there's a cost to that for the district um, because we contract with the Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative to make the claims on our behalf to Medicaid and they charge us a 10% surcharge. Um, so if you can see, we're increasing special education contract services within the district. We're providing more medical services for medically needy kids. Um, means that we're able to generate a larger re reimbursement for the municipality, but it means that we have to incur a larger um, overhead billing cost to process those claims. Next is translation services. Um, for anyone who was and many of you were present for the all are welcome dinner. I think it is clear <laughs> why our need for translation services um, is increasing. We've actually already exhausted the account for translation services for the current year. Um, the number of pieces of communication that need translation is increasing. The number of languages spoken within the district is increasing. And so I think that uh, translation services is an area of growth for the budget for um, the foreseeable future. <coughs> Next area is general education tuition, vocational. Um, we have very little vocational costs as a district um, because of the arrangement with Smith Vocational being within Northampton. But there are certain students who qualify for vocational services outside of Northampton. Um, and so we have. Um, I think we have two students now who um, have vocational services at, in settings other than uh, Smith Voc. Those are, those are costs that are not currently reflected in the current budget because there are services that occurred prior or after the start of the school year and um, are expected to continue for next year. So um, that tuition is added to the level service budget. And then homeless transportation. Um, sadly, the number of homeless students is increasing in the district. Um, there is an obligation when a student is homeless, uh, well, a right, I should say, when a student is homeless to either be educated in the district that the student was in when he became homeless or to be educated in the district where this student is residing while homeless. Um, and in the case that a student has to be transported from where they are homeless to another district, the resident district and the prior resident district are responsible for splitting the cost of transportation. So um, as homelessness increases, our cost for homeless transportation is increasing. So the overall, uh, the overall sum for the level service budget is $1,332,999. That would be just status quo. We do have some cost savings, though. Um, the primary area of cost savings is turnover. Um, any, any year, we're turning over about 15% of the teaching staff, more in other areas of the um, other bargaining units. So um, it's often the case that someone will retire and be replaced by someone who comes in at a lower level. Um, the net effect of that and this year's changes is $392,313. We're also able to save some money in substitutes. Um, this was, this is an area that I feel very happy about um, because one of the, one of the findings, if you go back to my entry findings, was that we were spending a lot of money on subs. Um, it seemed like folks were spending a lot of time not in their duty station. Um, in fact, in 2015, we spent $406,000 on sub coverage. Um, 
We thought because we had started to make some changes and started to just surface this issue with people that we might save some this year. So we budgeted 400,000 for the current budget. Based on our actual usage of subs this year, uh, which is much lower than in prior years, we think we can go with 310,000 for next year. So about 90% reduction. And so I just wanna really thank everybody who heard my plea on that. Um, and I wanna say this, you know, we do look at, we do look at staff attendance on a regular basis as an alt team. And one of the indicators that we look at are days of the week, because the conventional <coughs> wisdom is that if you have a lot of sick days on Fridays and Mondays, that may be an indication of inappropriate or misuse of sick time. We see zero evidence of that in Northampton. In fact, our day with the greatest outage is Wednesday. It's kind of like a normal shaped curve where Monday and Friday are the lowest and it kind of works up to a peak on Wednesday and then goes back down again. Um, so I, I think that um, for whatever reason, the attendance has been much improved and it allows us to do some things in the budget. So I'm, I'm just very thankful for that. We also, like residents and drivers and any energy user across the, the world at this time, I think, is are experiencing some savings in utilities. So we think we can reduce our budget, $65,000 in utilities. We think we will have fewer retirees <coughs> this year. When somebody retires, um, we have to pay, we have to buy back their unused sick days based on um, the lesser number of retirees. We think we can reduce sick leave buyback by 8,500. So altogether, the cost savings is $555,812. We also have some revenue changes. The first is an increase in circuit breaker of $179,761. This is money that comes to the district as reimbursement for costs of students whose cost of education exceeds four times the foundation amount. Um, as you'll recall, we're kind of holding some money in escrow this year because we experienced an increase in special education and some other accounts. Um, the bad news is it makes it hard to get through the year. The good news is it increases the circuit breaker claim for the following year. Um, we do think that, and, and remember, this 179 also reflects the change from last year because we spend <coughs> one year circuit breaker in the following year. Um, so we have an increase there that we can put towards our budget. The next area is school choice. Um, one of the things that I had talked about somewhat reluctantly because I feel kind of guilty in a way about this is um, increasing school choice is part of a way of increasing our stability and sustainability. Um, and one of the proposals or projections I had given, I talked about increasing school choice by about $50,000, which I thought uh, might be reasonable. It looks like we're increasing school choice into the district about $78,000. So that's additional revenue for next year's budget. Um, we are anticipating a reduction in Grant 240, which is the special education grant. Um, and I'll just point it out for the public. I think that there are some folks who believe costs of special education are covered 100% by federal dollars in some grant program. That's not the case. The grant is whatever the grant is, and it has been um, being reduced. You know, we've had sequesters and other things at the federal level that have reduced the amount of money that's available to distribute through just what's called discretional spending. Um, so we're, we're projecting a, a decrease in our special education grant for next year. Hopefully it won't be this bad, but um, we're putting it at $62,000 just to kind of make sure that we don't get caught short on that. And then um, we're also proposing later on in this budget, you'll see some changes to our athletic fee <coughs> structure, which would net an additional $7,291. Um, the total of all of those revenue changes is $202,680. So the net cost 
is the cost of the fixed increases minus the savings minus the additional revenue and, and this the additional revenue is exclusive of the athletic fee increase because that athletic fee increase kind of resides within a revolving account that's dedicated to athletics so it, it shouldn't really be part of this um, so the overall net is five hundred and eighty one thousand seven hundred and ninety eight dollars which is a two point one four percent increase over the current year's budget um, in the overall city's stability plan the projection is for schools to have a 2.75 percent increase the amount of a 2.75 increase for the schools for this year would be seven hundred and forty six thousand four hundred and seventy four dollars um, my philosophy on targets whether I've been approaching them as a superintendent with a target or as a cost center manager with the target is I will do my level best to make the target but I won't propose a budget that I think is going to be bad for kids if it if it's you know above the if it if it it doesn't it, I'm not allowed to see the target um, as you recall last year um, we couldn't live within the 2.75 percent cap um, we actually came in with a budget that was fifty-five thousand dollars over the 2.75 percent cap and the mayor in a way that i think was very decent and fair um, and supportive of the schools funded that additional fifty-five thousand dollars this year i think we can live with the cap i think it's fine in fact i think we've got a lot of room under the cap and so i think it would be irresponsible to advocate for any more than the 2.75 percent that's available under that plan so we what's left between the 746,474 that's available under the cap and the 581 that we need for fixed cost increases is 164,676 and that becomes sort of the first piece of um, funding available to try to move the district forward I should also uh, should also mention I'm very happy we have this because you know I know that it is a very difficult um, fiscal year on the municipal side um, right now I think from the mayor's state of the city speech we were looking at essentially level funding I think it was a net increase or net decrease of two thousand dollars when you look at all the different funds so um, very happy that we're able to do what we're able to do within the 2.75%. Um, so, moving forward to our first goal, which is to increase opportunity for learning. We have three proposals underneath this. First is to open a pre-K satellite with a full day option for four-year-olds. Cost of that is $28,095. Second is to provide element, uh, librarians for elementary students. That's $98,646. And third, to help high school students become better readers. Cost of that is $17,772. Um, let me start by talking about preschool and say that in the years since preschool has been at Bridge Street enrollment has expanded from 60 to 84 students as you know um, we just had a need to open a, an eighth session at Bridge Street I think the trajectory for um, the future is just ever increasing enrollment and preschool grades and I think um, the projection is for students presenting with increasingly complex needs um, and so I think the, the preschool program as it exists at Bridge Street now is quite a bit different from the preschool program in its original move there. And I think the um, needs of the preschool program have to a certain extent impeded uh, progress within the K through <coughs> five realm. Um, because as the preschool has grown and as the needs have grown, the demands of the program on the overall resources of the school 
has become quite taxing. Um, and additionally, we have, um, from our discussions last year about preschool, talked about there are other parts of the city that have needs for preschool. And you know, it is, it is to a certain extent, um, would be better if kids could have preschool closer to where they attend school. Um, so our proposal would be to essentially split the preschool in half and to offer a full day option for four year olds at both Bridge Street and Leeds. The bubbles in this chart represent the sessions and the columns in the chart represent teachers. So if you look at Bridge, you've got a teacher in the sort of overall green bubble that con contains the two smaller bubbles um, who would have three and four year olds in the morning the four-year-olds would stay on till the afternoon, and so they'd have a full day. And then the other teacher at Bridge Street would have a three-year-old session in the morning and a four-year-old session in the afternoon. Do the same thing at Leeds. Um, this would provide us <coughs> with a way to reduce the um, demands of the preschool program on the overall Bridge Street infrastructure. It would allow us to save some money because um, as this committee knows so well, when you tier transportation, you can reduce costs. So we could use the same buses in two waves to have um, a preschool with slightly different start times at the two schools. That would also help with um, parking and congestion at both schools because we could have the preschool start in one school slightly before the K to five and start slightly after the K to five at the other school. So kids would be entering and leaving at different times as the main body of students. Um, and you'd have approximately 50% of the kids starting in the school that they would eventually go on to attend anyways. So you'd be reducing a transition for them. Um, so for all those reasons, I think this is a good way to enhance our preschool program. I think it will make it the, four, the full day option for four year olds in particular will make it um, much more attractive for peers, um, which is a group that we always have trouble attracting. Um, I think that many of the kids who are currently attending as four year olds as peers are, piercing, are piecing together preschool experiences from our half day program and someone else's half day program. So that would take that need away. So I think we could um, better serve kids in a lot of ways under this model. Second um, proposal under increasing opportunity is to provide librarians for elementary students, um, which is another one of the things that haunted me. It's just like the, the kids who've been haunting me for the last month. I remember at the end of last year's budget discussions, um, Ms. Hennessy asked a question about elementary librarians and I'd given some question about or given some response about behavior needs being more pressing at this time and that's where we needed to put our resources and she said yeah but I think librarians are pressing too um, and I've been thinking a lot about that over the past several months uh, especially since as you know so much of the discussion has been about increasing literacy and early literacy you know I think it leaves me in a somewhat false position to be advocating for doing everything we can to make our young students better readers and not providing them with a librarians when we know that that's one of the resources that could really help them become better readers. Um, just some data, this is correlational, so you have to take it with a grain of salt. This is from a, um, a very comprehensive study of Illinois elementary schools. It involved over 300 schools. They found that the mean weekly hours of librarian time um, per 100 students in the schools in the top 25% was 7.1. The librarian hours in schools in the lowest 25% was 3.8. The mean librarian hours for Northampton right now is zero. Um, so if we were able to add the two, they would put us at 5.8 um, librarian hours per 100 elementary students, which is kind of right smack in the middle of that range. Uh, I think it would be, I just think it would be a good way to support kids. 
You know, we've been we've been through the meetings um, with Mr. Winnick, where he's shown us, basically confronted us with some of the materials from our own library. Um, that was some of it was so dated as to verge on the offensive. Um, we've tried for over a year to digitize our libraries with parent support and retired librarian support, but it just doesn't really work. Um, so I think if we were able to put two elementary uh, librarians to be shared among the four schools, we'd pair them much similar way that we could pair um, schools for the, the preschool model. Um, we'd be taking a giant step forward for our kids. Uh, the third is to help high school students become better readers. Um, this is a quote from the um, National Governors Association. Strong reading, writing, and thinking skills are essential not only <coughs> for success in school and in the workplace, but also for participation in civic life. Um, so this is an only an issue of academic achievement, although that's important. It's an issue of success in school and life and an issue of democracy. Um, so some people have asked, why would we need a reading class at the high school? Um, <coughs> so let me tell you about students who we see um, going to this class. It, it really is just one class. Um, and a small number of students, primarily ninth graders, but also a few 10th graders. These are kids who, um, for some of them, but not all, have had very significant disruption <coughs> in their formal education. Some of these kids have been in two or three um, different school districts during the time when reading is typically taught, which can be tough because districts have different approaches. And if you're missing school time, and if you're behind because you're just trying to um, acclimate to the school, and then if the approach is changing on you, um, gaps can grow. Some schools come, um, uh, some, some of the students for this class are students who come um, with gaps in their formal education. Um, some of the students may be newcomers to the country. Some of the students may be ELLs. Um, and so there are kids for, who, for whatever reason, uh, aren't very strong readers. And when you can't read at a certain level in the high school, you really have a very significant barrier to accessing all of the rest of the content in the high school. Um, because in terms of as a former high school teacher, I could give a lower level text, um, but if you didn't know how to read, there wasn't much I could do to teach you to read. Uh, so I think that, I think that this, um, this class will be a last chance for a lot of kids, um, maybe the last chance they ever get to success in school and in the workplace and to be able to participate in our civic life. Um, so moving on to the next goal, to support students' emotional health, um, we're proposing to increase psychological support at the elementary and middle school levels, to provide <coughs> consultative services to Ryan Road, the cost there is $10,000, and to increase counseling support at the middle school level, the cost is $49,000. $323. So talking about each of these, I'll take the first two together. Um, the rationale for increasing psychological support at the elementary and middle school levels um, is really based on the data from our universal screening, which includes a, a social emotional measure, um, in which we found that 13 to 19 percent of elementary students struggle with emotional difficulties, conduct issues, peer problems, or hyperactivity. These are not necessarily kids who are receiving any kind of special service, um, but they need some kind of service if they're going to be successful. Um, and the time to address it ideally is in the elementary, if not in the elementary, at least in the middle school level, um, because especially emotional problems and conduct problems become increasingly difficult to remediate and increasingly problematic for the individual and everyone around the individual as the student gets older. The second um, goal we have for increasing um, support and supporting students' emotional health 
the elementary level, is to provide consultative services to Ryan Road School. Um, what's true about the 13 and 19 percent is true for Ryan Road too, but there's something special happening there this year. Um, they have experienced a significant uptick in the number of students who are experiencing significant deprivations or trauma. Um, there are students there who live under a cloud of uncertainty. They don't know what home they'll go to at night. They don't know if this is the day that their siblings will be separated from them. And it, they're crying out to us for help. I've seen it with my own eyes. They're literally crying to us for help. Um, and the Ryan Road staff are doing yeoman's work down there to try to support these kids. Um, but I think they really could use, the, the level of need at the school has reached the level where they could use some consultative services to sort of enhance the therapeutic milieu of the whole school. Um, you know, I think, and just trying to describe the scenario down there, Greg Kerstetter, I think, um, probably stated it as well as anyone in the meeting I was at. He's our tiered support specialist down there. So he's one of the ones who's primarily in contact with a lot of the students who experienced some of the challenges I just described. And um, I was at a meeting once where he was trying to describe his job to another one of the teachers in the district. And he said something like, uh, I apologize if I'm misquoting you, Greg. I think it would be difficult for you to imagine how dynamic the challenges of my position really are. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I've seen him doing his job, and so I know exactly what he's talking about. It is dynamic. It is um, very energetic, even, I would say. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, I would just plead on behalf of Ryan Road School to be able to provide them some additional consultative support. Um, the third goal in the area of emotional health is to increase the amount of counseling support at the middle school. Um, this is looking forward a couple of months to what middle school will be in September. And this graph shows the number of students requiring counseling services through IEPs alone. This doesn't include kids who are receiving counseling through Section 504, doesn't include kids who are receiving counseling just because they need counseling but don't have any kind of a plan. You can see the incoming sixth graders have a counseling need that is almost equal to what the seventh and eighth grade um, will be combined. So you'll have, uh, you'll have over 100 students there just on IEPs needing counseling support. You can't ask one person to do it and expect good things to happen. Okay, so the next goal is to put resources to their highest use. And we have two goals under this. Um, the first is to maximize principal time for instructional leadership, the cost of $19,800. And the second is to maximize special ed educator time for instruction. The cost is $49,323. So let me just talk about what I mean by maximizing principal time for instructional leadership. Um, as many of you may know, teachers don't have duties um, in our contract. And so recesses at the elementary school are usually supervised by ESPs. And um, ESPs are one of the groups that we have the most challenge finding subs for. When you look at our, my dashboard I get every morning on how the sub situation is in the district, it'll usually say, you know, anywhere between like a 75 and a 90% fill rate but the ones that are unfilled are typically ESPs. Um, and so since ESPs are supervising the, the recesses, when ESPs are sick and they can't be covered, it means principals are supervising the re recesses. And so I asked principals to do a little time study and we found that they're spending about one and a quarter hours per week, um, per day rather, um, supervising recess times 180 days, times four principals, that's 900, 900 hours per year. That's approximately 20% of the instructional time in the day when the principals could be observing classes or providing other kinds of instructional leadership. When you figure, okay, what is that 900 hours within the context of the principal's overall 
duty year by their individual contracts. We're spending at least $45,000 in principal salary for recess coverage. Um, not to mention the real loss, which is the real loss of the, them as a resource for their teachers during that time. The cost, on the other hand, of six lunch recess aides would be $19,800. I think it would be money well spent to free the principals up from this responsibility. Now, this isn't a ban on recess. I say this as someone who, as a student in school, had to spend a lot of recesses inside for misbehaving. <laughs> Um, that's not, I'm not saying that the, the principals are misbehaving or that they can't have contact with kids and they can't go out to recess. What I'm saying is I don't want their days to be interrupted <coughs> because they have to go do recess. I don't want them to say, well, I can't schedule an observation today because <coughs> the ESP didn't show up and now I have to go out to recess. I want it to be an option for them but not a requirement for them. The second is to maximize special educator time for instruction. You can think of this as one of the very sensible ideas that came through um, collaboration with teachers on the budget. Um, it's my understanding from the association president that um, <coughs> providing an ETL at the elementary level was very high on their list of wants when she um, conducted her listening tour across the district. So um, let me just share some data with you and with the public from what's really thought of as the most comprehensive study on personnel needs in special education, one of the best time studies out there. Um, this is from Spence. Um, it says that an average special educator per month spends four hours printing or copying special education forms, two hours scheduling IEP meetings, an hour mailing notices to parents, four hours tracking paperwork from other teachers that's required for the IEP process or other aspects of special education, seven and a half hours conducting assessments and 4.2 hours reviewing existing assessment information. <coughs> that's 22.7 hours per month and does not include any time attending meetings. Each one of the special ed meetings is probably an hour to two hours um, on top of that. You can have many of those within a month, especially if the month happens to be May or June. Um, so as someone who at one point in my career was responsible for all these things, let me say I find this estimate to be very accurate, if not understating the amount of time um, spent on paperwork in special ed. So if you accept the 22.7 hours per month, that's about three days per month of teacher work or 30 days per year or one and a half months of instructional time. But fortunately, this stuff isn't all done during the school day or kids would be missing a lot of instruction. Um, most of this stuff is done after hours um, or done during prep periods. Some of it is done during the day. Um, but it, it's, it's a considerable burden. At the high school, we have a team leader who takes care of a lot of these duties for students and, or, and for other teachers in ninth through 12th grade. At the middle school, we have an associate principal who forms, performs essentially the same role. But at the elementaries, we don't have, we don't have that role anymore. Um, so um, before making this recommendation, I asked um, it, the special ed department to give me some data on the number of special ed initial and reevaluations that are conducted just at K to five. Um, see if there would be some justification there, whoops, and learned that annually we have about 150 special ed either initial evals and re-evals in grades K to five. Um, so I, if we had an ETL and that person's responsibility was just to do these things, um, it wouldn't completely alleviate that paperwork um, burden that was described on the previous slide. But the initials and the reevals are by far the most difficult and paperwork intensive part of the special ed process. Um, and I think with 150 and the additional work that goes beyond the meetings for those meetings, it, it certainly is justified and would allow teachers to spend their limited resources of time, because after all, we all only have 24 hours in a day on other things like planning lessons, designing interventions, modifying assignments, 
doing all the types of things we really want special ed teachers doing. Um, next, uh, we have two proposals around STEM education. Uh, the first is to establish two global STEM education programs. One would be at Jackson Street and the other would be at JFK. The cost of that is $12,000. And the second is to increase funding for the robotics program. This is a slide right from the Global STEM Center website. And let me explain what's happening here. Um, there is a class on the, I believe it's the class on the far left, is a classroom in Cape Cod. The classroom in the middle <coughs> is a classroom from a school in Mexico. The individual on the right is a NASA scientist. And that <coughs> thing at the bottom is our galaxy. And those kids are pointing the <coughs> telescope. Not a simulation, actually pointing the telescope and working with each other to do real science. Um, so I, I propose this for two reasons. Um, connections between our students and people of the global majority, um, helping them form those connections, I think, is really going to be important for um, positioning them for the future. Every single demographic trend points to the east and points to the global south as the place where all of the industrial and economic growth is going to be in the near future. Um, so I think if we want to set our students up for success, we have to help them understand other cultures and connect with people from other cultures and understand <coughs> that a lot of the work is going to be done like this. It's going to be done um, between countries. It's going to be done um, virtually and <coughs> online. Um, and there are just so many, so many pieces that go beyond, um, go beyond language study if you want to understand a different culture. Um, understanding the ways of being of another culture, I think, would be a great experience for our kids. And for kids who want to challenge themselves to really excel in science and engineering, imagine this. You're actually pointing the telescope. You know, you're not. You're doing real science in a real grown-up way with real scientists, not reading about it in a book. Um, and a, a cost, which is minimal, $12,000, it's really just the cost of um, the training for our staff. I think it, it really will open up new windows of opportunity for kids. Next is to uh, increase funding for the robotics program. This is kind of a, almost a challenge grant, if you will. Um, as you know, last year we formed a partnership with Smith Volk um, for the robotics program, which allowed us to move from the age of wood to the age of titanium. Um, it really allowed us to leverage a lot of resources, including um, staff who were skilled at sophisticated machine work, um, all of the fabrication machinery, um, transportation for students, as well as funding. Um, and they sort of kicked a little bit more into the program this year and sort of challenged us to match it as a way of <coughs> continuing to move the program forward. And I want to say, after all, the program began at Northampton High School. Um, and I want to be a good partner, especially because we've really benefited so much from, um, from this partnership. And I will say, one of the things I've heard the teachers at Smith Vokes say is that and much the same way as the global STEM gives kids a real world experience of doing something true, not, not a simulation, um, their, uh, their classes have been enhanced by this by having students experience a real production cycle um, where the robotics team designs something and says, okay, we need it in 48 hours, you know, and then they have to experience the real grown-up pressure of figuring out how to build it. It also has been a great experience for the students in the club because they get the experience of having parts designed to their exact specifications that don't work. 
<laughs> and I think you know, they have to be much more clear in what they're asking. Um, so our next goals talk about increasing equity and paying fairly. The first is to continue to equalize building-based budgets. Cost there is $22,844. And the next is to extend minimum wage protections to all school employees. Cost there is $25,000. Um, let me start with this chart, which uh, I admit is a little bit difficult to follow. Um, this is one of the means we use for trying to have a rational way of achieving fairness in the building-based budgets. Um, so one of the things we do is look at, so what would the foundation formula say you need for equipment and tech? Um, you can calculate that, that amount to the dollar if you know your, your um, school's enrollment, which we do. Um, so I put some pieces of the formula on the bottom just to show you that it <coughs> is graduated. The assumption is that pre-K is $220 per kid. Um, and then K to 8 is 437. The jump there um, <coughs> based on the fact that kids in K to 8 need to access mu uh, much more diverse curriculum materials than kids in preschool do. Uh, and often preschool programs are not full day. Um, and then in 9 through 12, the base estimate is $700. Again, um, the high school program involves much more sophisticated equipment, many more sets of books. Um, it includes typically an athletic program, which comes with its own costs of equipment. Um, and now there are also other multipliers for low income, um, for disability, for ELL. And, and so the, the formula is more complicated than that, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how it gets started. And so we calculated out what the foundation budget <coughs> would, would say schools need. Remember, this is a foundation budget that I have argued up and down is inadequate. Um, and then said, OK, where are each of the schools compared to what the formula would say? So that's what's shown in the first line. These are all amounts below because none of the schools come up to the amount that the formula would put in these two lines. Um, Bridge Street is $189 below. Jackson Street, $242 below. Leeds, $276 below. Ryan Road, $200 below. JFK, $210 below. And the high school, $510 below, um, in part because of that $700 increase. Now, there is one piece that's held out of this because um, we haven't figured out how to do how to um, address it yet. This is equipment and tech. And the tech is held still in a um, district-wide account rather than being um, dispersed to the school. There's about $55,000 in hardware. Um, and that's because the PTOs have been contributing to, to a large degree um, technology uh, resources to their own schools. And so one of the things we try to do as regular readers of the District Improvement Insider know is use our district funds to kind of <coughs> equalize that to a certain extent. Um, so there's another 55,000 to be spread <coughs> over the schools in some way, um, mainly to try to put people on a level technology playing field. So that's, that's the first <coughs> line. The second line is our proposed increase per pupil. And so we're using here kind of a hold harmless logic which says that if we have a certain amount of money to increase with um, and everybody is below, we don't want to just give it all to the school that's the most below because then it means everyone else gets nothing. So um, our theory here is to give each school a minimum of $5 per student increase and then for schools that are farther behind to give them an enhancement. So Jackson Street would get six instead of five Leeds would get $7 instead of 5 and the high school would get $14 <coughs> instead of 5 And so the next um, line shows the net increase. You notice that Bridge Street is a decrease. The reason for that is um, this chart takes into a, uh, account the possibility that you would approve the um, moving of the preschool, which means some of those preschool kids would go over to Leeds. So you see that the Leeds increase is significant it's because they're picking up the per pupil on the preschoolers moving over, and Bridge Street is getting a reduction on the 
um, preschoolers that it's losing, but all of the schools would be closer to that foundation predicted amount at the end than they are now on a per pupil basis. Um, so I will just point out this. One of the things that the Foundation Commission has said, and I think this shows so clearly, is because the entire budget, the entire formula is inadequate, especially in the areas of special education and employee expenses, uh, benefits, um, people steal from other areas of their budgets. And one of the places people steal from is in materials and supplies. And we're doing it too. So the second uh, goal under this <coughs> is to extend minimum wage protections to all school employees. Um, I was really saddened um, to learn that we have people in the district currently who are not making the minimum wage, um, which is allowable due to some um, rule for municipalities, which I don't understand. But even if it's allowable, I don't think it's moral. Um, really bothers me since in my prior district I went on this big campaign to get everybody to ten dollars and lo and behold you know three years after that <coughs> campaign I'm still leading a district with people below ten dollars so um, the proposal would be to increase cafeteria subs who currently make 975 to 1050 an hour ESP subs who make uh, 975 to 1050 an hour and then to increase our teacher sub rates um, five dollars across the tiers so um, non-licensed subs would go from 70 to 75 licensed would go from 75 to 80 and retired NPS teachers would go from 80 to 85 for those on the bottom level they're right on the edge of being below minimum wage too um, if you figure that it's based on a seven hour day although it's not really seven hours that's how everything is calculated for payroll um, the non-licensed people are essentially working for $10 right now. Um, so this would be my <coughs> proposal. I would just point out um, the cafeteria subs are paid from the cafeteria revolving account. So that isn't reflected in the overall proposal because the pros proposal just talks about the um, appropriated funds. So we'd be asking the, the uh, cafeteria, I mean the, the, the food service manager to pick this up in his budget, um, which is a budget which has a deficit. but. I think it's the right thing to do for our people. And then the next uh, three proposals have to do with extending st uh, stability and sustainability. First is a proposal to raise athletic fees. Um, those of you who were here last year will recall uh, there was a proposal, sort of a leftover or a legacy proposal, if you will, to increase the hockey fees last year. and. The committee put a stop to that and said, let's take a look at the athletic program as a whole. Let's not you know, target any one sport for increases, but let's see what makes sense for the program in its entirety. Um, so our current structure is, uh, has three tiers in three ways, if you will. There's um, a full price, reduced price, for kids who are eligible for reduced lunch, and then a further reduced price for kids who are eligible for free lunch. And then there's a declining rate only on the full price for each sport that uh, an athlete has within the year. So the first sport is 175, the second sport is 145, the third sport is 115, and then regardless of whether it's first, second, or third, the reduced uh, lunch fee is $35 and the free lunch fee is $25. There's a family cap of $600 so that um, students, or families who have multiple student athletes playing multiple sports do not um, pay more than $600. That cap really takes effect if you have a family with two athletes in the spring. Um, so they would pay really the full freight for the, the first and second sport. But when you get into the spring sports, um, the, the cap would take over. Um, there is an upcharge right now for hockey of $350. That's based on basically just a double fee, 175 times two. So our recommended fee schedule would be basically a uh, $30 increase 
on the tiers, uh, the full price tiers. So first split would go from 205, I mean, sorry, 175 to 205. Second sport from 145 to 175. The third sport would go from 145, 115 to 145. And then the reduced and free would go a $15 increase. So reduced would go from 35 to 50, and free would go from $25 to 40. The family cap would hit at 750, so that the cap didn't nullify the effect of the increased fees. The cap would hit at the exact same spot. It would be for a family with two athletes in the spring, the cap would take over instead of the individual sport fees. Um, so the upcharge for hockey, uh, we would recommend a $30 increase, and that's based on the upcharge is already a doubling, and so we don't want to double the $30 increase as well. So it's $30 more on sort of their first $205. <coughs> Dollars and then just another $205. Um, I don't think that's right. I don't know. Let me take that back. Um, so the, the, the up fee on hockey is based on just increasing $30 like we are on all the rest of the sports. Um, we would also add in looking at it an up fee for football um, because when you, you look at it, even with its gate, by far, football is the most expensive sport to run. Um, and there's a very strong equity question of why you would charge an upcharge for hockey when it's a relatively cheap sport based on the number of athletes, not based on the overall <coughs> cost of the sport. But it's a four, I think four district co-op at this point. Um, when hockey, I mean, when football as a program is so much more expensive. Um, so there would be a $20 upcharge on football. Yes. Does that upcharge apply to all three tiers? Like, so if you're paying only forty dollars for your sport, are you still paying that two hundred twenty-five dollars in addition, or is that only for full? That's full price. It's only just full for price. full price. Yep. Okay. So then, we have proposed a lot in terms of things we'd like <coughs> to do. And we only have about $167,000 available under the cap, which means the rest needs to come from restructuring within the budget. Um, so we're recommending about $41,000 of reductions. That includes reductions of seven ESPs, one at $140,000, 1.1 teachers, $57,488, a .33 tutor, $13,408. Professional development, um, it's not a total reduction, but you know, a reduction of 11,000 of their professional development budgets. Let's talk, I know people have given good feedback about it, but people just aren't using it. I think it's a place where we can save money. Uh, I'm getting, at this point, less than one communication per week, so it's a lot of money to spend for one communication per week. Um, the preschool tier, as I said, by staggering the start times of the preschools, we can save some money on transportation. And then we'd reduce the hours for our Friday preschool ESPs. Um, I believe, believe everyone knows that preschool is a four day a week program. On the fifth <coughs> day, there are um, some ESPs who stay to basically clean the rooms, which require a much more extensive cleaning than typical room cleaning is, um, but we think we can cut back some hours there um, to get to the total of $240,896. And so then all the increases that we discussed going through the proposal are on the right-hand column. Um, so you can see them, they add all up. And then subtracting out the 164676 that's available under the cap um, we, that amount is 245960 so it's about $5,000 off. It's not quite balanced, but we think, you know, with all the stuff that happens within a um, many, many, many million dollar budget, we'll be able to catch the $5,000 somewhere. Um, 
So it's not, it's not without cost. You know? It's not without an impact to people. But um, we, hire, we have hired 25 ESPs since the beginning of the year so far. So we think that the ESPs who are being reduced would have a very strong possibility of having positions to be recalled into. Um, it's also true that we're creating positions at the same time we're reducing positions. So some of the people whose positions are being reduced on one side might be eligible to pick up some of the positions that are being created on the other side. Um, overall, I think <coughs> it's the best for the district. Um, although I, I do regret that it can't be done without some impact on people. Um, next, um, this is not a recommendation I like, but I think in the old sort of big picture, it's the best thing to do. Um, we have a request for two sabbaticals, um, which are pending right now. Our contract allows up to 1% of teaching staff at any time to have sabbaticals, so that would be basically three teachers. Um, the estimated cost of the sabbaticals and subs is $67,587. Um, and the reason, the reason that I'm just not recommending it is because I'm haunted by those kids. We could do it, there is money, but it means we won't be providing one of those things on that list that I think is good for the kids. Um, and there's a reason uh, which I'll talk about in the next slides as well. Um, one of the things that I'm very motivated by is trying to keep large reductions of staff as far away from the district for as long as possible. This was a chart from last year's budget um, when we were looking at this, what we called <coughs> at that time our district stability plan. Um, the green amounts in these charts represent the beginning balances in school choice. Um, if you look at 2016, you can see there's a little bit of blue underneath there. That's because we were $55,000 short last year, which the city <coughs> graciously kicked in. Um, so we ended up not going into the blue last year. Um, and then we predicted this year we would be almost a half a million dollars in debt, or not in debt, but we'd have a shortfall of about a half a million dollars and we'd be faced with the choice, do we want to use some of the school choice that we collect this year to fill that? Um, which is not necessarily a good thing to do because our, our practice is to use one year school choice in the following year, um, but it would be an option for staving off massive layoffs. And then if you continued that process in 2018, you'd be dipping in that about a um, little more than three quarters of a million dollars into the, the choice you were taking in that year. And then if we continued that path by 2019, if we spent all the money we had as a beginning balance and all the money we took in as choice in the year, we'd still be $452,000 short and we'd be starting with $0 balance for the following year. So, you know, 2017 was looked at as a tough choice year, 2018 was looked at as an emergency choice year, and 2019 was possibly disaster year. Um, we've been able to revise <coughs> that stability plan. Um, based on a couple of things. Um, last year, we ended up um, saving um, in different accounts about uh, $300,000, which meant we could spend less choice than we had planned on. And um, we also took in more choice than we had projected we would. Um, so those two things, along with the $55,000, really changes the picture quite a bit. Um, so instead of facing a difficult choice this year, we're fine this year. Um, there's a possibility that we may have a slight problem to grapple with in 2019. We could make it through 2020 even, and now the disaster year is not 2019, but 2021. And you know, I'm very motivated as I continue to try to bring you proposals that I think will be in the kids' best interest, to put this off as far as I can, because this is in nobody's interest. You know, the greatest evil I'm trying to um, avoid on ha behalf of the employees is unemployment. 
And so I want to push that out as far as I can. And I have hope that now that you know the <coughs> legislature's own task force has told it that it's underfunding Chapter 70, somewhere along this line we may get some catch-up funds which will help to um, delay that day even more. So that's my FY17 budget proposal, and I'll take any questions people have. How much is the state giving you an additional Chapter 70 this year? Uh, it's about 55000 uh, Yes, it is. About $20 <laughs> the kid. Yeah, it's 55000 So. so much to support students' emotional health at the elementary and the middle schools. And one of the concerns that's been raised to me is that transition into the high school, um, not having a homeroom and not having, you know, only having four classes, that some, some of the kids are sort of floundering. It's hard to form connections with adults and to have sort of a, a close relationship with someone unless they're involved in sports or activities. Is there some sort of plan for that? Is the, do you, is that need being met in a way that I'm not aware of? Well, I think you're touching on one of the heartbreaks of my first year in Northampton. Um, when I came to the district, there was an advisory program at the high school. Um, the unfortunate thing about it was that it was not compliant with the contract. Um, so we spent a great deal of time in negotiations um, on a grievance that made it all the way to level two last year um, on addressing the, uh, the, the advisory program at the high school, which was, had the goal of trying to get an op create an opportunity for kids to form connections with parents into some kind of a form that um, would comport with the contract. So um, there's the Lens 21 program this year at the high school, <coughs> which I think um, in some ways is an improvement on the old program. Uh, I think one of the obvious benefits is it is not a violation of the contract. But I, I do think that the traditional advisory model, which, M which um, NEASC had supported for so many years, was uh, helpful in trying to create those connections between students and teachers. And you know, it's always, it's always the kids on the fringe, I think, who are the ones who are most impacted by reductions of programs like that. Because many kids naturally form strong connections with teachers or with other adults in the school. But you know, there are some kids who won't form the relationship unless you deliberately create an environment that's conducive to the relationship. So um, the, only, the only thing I could suggest is, you know, it, it may be something to discuss in contract negotiations. It could be something to um, provide feedback to the high school on for further revisions of Lens 21. Um, but that, that was a loss. The loss of the advisor, I think, was a loss in a certain way for some kids. Um, if the STEM program is housed at Jackson Street School, does that mean that all children <coughs> in the elementary schools have some sort of access to it? And that's the central location? Um, and I also would like to point out that I think that the movement now is also to make it a STEAM program, and we should keep that in mind as we move forward. So um, thank you for that question. Initially, we the uh, Global STEM Foundation um, approached us with the possibility of one site in the district. Um, because it's a, a real extensive connection, it's kids to kids, teachers to teachers, principals to principals, and if there is such a thing in the other district, superintendent to superintendent. Um, and our thought was first to do it at JFK, because then all students would have an opportunity to participate at it in some time. Um, but Ms. Agna was very forceful in her advocacy to um, expand that. And we really pushed um, 
to expand to a second elementary school, one of the things that she brought to the table, which I think was um, very compelling for the folks doing this, is that she already has a connection with another school overseas. Um, so I think we were able to um, extend it that way. What I'd like to do is see how the first year of this program goes and see if there's an interest in other schools expanding it further in year two. But I think uh, going to two schools in one year is about the, the capacity for our district and also about the capacity for the Global STEM program. So is it an actual program that we're buying? I don't quite understand that. It is an organization that provides professional development um, and the main and services and the main form of the services is the connecting between schools. So they're, they're active in schools all around the globe um, and are, are, are seeking to form partnerships. Um, I'll say this, it, it was a bit of, um, it was a, a bit of luck. I'm trying to think of the other word for luck, the better word, but it's, it was luck. Um, I remember two years ago uh, attending a superintendent's conference um, and one of the sessions was on global STEM. And I was, it piqued my interest, so I thought I would attend. Um, and I heard these presenters. It actually was, I believe, that school on the Cape that was doing the project with NASA and the school in Mexico. And I thought it was so amazing, but just nothing I, we, we would be ready to pull off. I was in another district at that time. Um, however, uh, <coughs> city hired one of the presenters as its uh, IT director. Um, so Antonio Pagan came to, to visit with me a few days after taking his office and said, so are you still interested in global STEM? So we were able to kind of to just luck out in that way. Um, but I, for the reasons I said, I think it's gonna really enhance the <coughs> science education at the schools. It's not meant to be any kind of a, a slight against the arts um, or the humanities, say that as a former English teacher. But you know, I, I think it's a unique opportunity for kids and would be a way to sort of really distinguish the services we provide for kids. Sorry, uh, I wasn't <laughs> sure who had their hand up first. Rebecca, then. A buzzer slick on the <laughs> Molly's, okay. Burnham's sure. question. So I'm just curious how it would roll out and which grades are, is every <clears throat> class gonna have access to this at the middle school and at Jackson Street? So we're in the very early process uh, <clears throat> of trying to develop the training model um, we know it, basically what the costs are because we know what's cost in other schools. But if we get to go ahead with the budget, what we would do is then form a formal training plan with Global STEM. At that point, the principals would be identifying the staff and finalizing which grades, which teachers, things like that. Ms. Hennessy. Yeah, I, John, uh, Dr. Provost, this is great. I love the Ryan Road. Um, the commitment to that. I think that's really important. As you know, I love the librarian um, <laughs> elementary school. And if you really get to listen to me a lot, I'd love to increase world language and music. But um, but I love how you describe the um, special ed and the work that the teachers do and the need at the elementary level for that. And you'll get a couple laughs in the audience maybe, but people also postpone meetings and that's also a pain I think for that's people. <laughs> um, I think it's really ethical to increase the minimum to the minimum wage and that's lovely. Um, the reading, I think that's great because as we see now at the high school level, we're seeing that even the SATs with the math is much more reading and I think that's important, which leads me to three questions or comments. One, we took away a writing program at the high school level and I know that's writing, but I know that um, there was a lot of discussion around <coughs> that and I'm wondering if there's a connection to the need now for reading and the taking away of that program. The second is, um, I, do you know the 1.1 teacher? And I'm uncomfortable with the athletic increase of a 60% increase for free lunch and a 17% increase. And I know they're incredibly different. Um, it's a large amount for families who are paying full, but it's a large amount for families who are um, getting free lunch, and I think that's a huge increase. So that's it. Okay. So. Uh, responding to each of those, yeah. I have very little knowledge of the taking away of the writing program. Mm -hmm. um, 
one of the discussions that Mr. Lombardi have had about this is whether it would be a replacement <coughs> model or whether it would be an additional class. Um, and we decided that at the end it would be best to have an in, uh, individual student by student determination. So some kids would be taking the reading and be taking ELA, okay. but for kids who have their schedules really crunched by other things, it would be a uh, substitution. So I think that for students who were in reading and ELA, they'd be getting support both with reading and writing. Um, and I think for many of the students whose schedules are constrained by other things, one of the things that might be constraining them is another class that's providing support in writing. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the uh, 1.1, do I know? Yeah, so um, one of the, the <coughs> half time teacher reduction is the half time reduction that we discussed last week or last time we got together to add the um, additional class at the preschool level. So that would just be continuing that reduction for next year. The other would be a reduction of a 0.6 special ed teacher at JFK. Okay. And then the increase um, on the lower tiers, I, I would be happy to um, work with Kara on a revised um, budget if that's the, that's the um, will of the committee. Uh, just to say a little bit about our thinking around that, um, you know, last year we went from what I would call uh, not really chaos, but a, a difficult budgeting model to some kind of predictability within sports, and that led to a large increase in the sports um, cost center. It's the largest increase of any of the cost centers last year. Uh, in my discussions with the athletic director this year, I said, we can't expect to have that same kind of increase. Um, so there were three options, um, reducing some of the programs, increasing um, the fees, or finding some other way to get the money. Or, or could have done it within the budget, but I didn't think it was right to give the cost center that kind of an increase two consecutive years. You know, it is true that overall, it's still not probably adequately funded, but it's now within the realm of other ad not adequately funded things within our budget. So um, it's, it is a fee increase that generates $7,000 in total. Um, tweaking those bottom two tiers a little bit probably would not reduce it to the point where there would be a reduction of sports, mm -hmm. maybe a reduction of a team, I don't know. But I mean, we <coughs> could rework that. Thank you. Dr. Baird. Yeah. Um, ish. Ish. Um, ish. First, I just want to applaud your work uh, and your, your team's work to put together the budget. I was really impressed with the way you described the way you got input from staff in creating the, the budget. And so I, I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, and my official title of my district is STEM director, so I was very excited to see some of the STEM pieces in here, and my, a lot of my questions around that have already been answered. Um, but I also want to go back to something that you talked about in your presentation, just highlight that a bit for the public. Um, so we know that some of the PTOs have more of an ability or a more robust fundraising capacity to provide technology resources than others. And um, you know, I've asked some questions offline or you know online um, and you, the work that you've done to help provide some equity around that in the district I think is something that is worth noting um, so some questions that I have um, so as a as a now former foster parent um, but as a spouse of a social worker um, and someone who knows Ryan Road I'm wondering if the support that you described and I almost teared up a little bit as you were describing the need is it sufficient for what the need is? So that's a question that I think we probably won't know until we try. Um, my, I do know that for $10,000, we could get some behavior analysts um, who would be able to set up some really therapeutic structures within the school and help teachers kind of understand how to respond to kids who are in a highly reactive mode and I think that that would have some impact um, I, I'll just say this when we were sitting around um, 
the table all <coughs> talking about what the most important needs were for each of the individual schools. The one thing Ryan Road asked for was help with this, this issue. Um, so, you know, to a certain extent, it'll depend on the, consul the consultant we get. And right now we're thinking there, there is an outfit that provides sort of a team of consultants and maybe a team approach might be better for Ryan Road. Um, but, you know, I guess what I could tell you is if we can train the staff and monitor the situation, you know, then I'll be able to better answer the question of whether that was a sufficient investment or whether we have to go farther. So I guess I would appreciate maybe some follow-up, you know, later on, later on in the next school year if this is, is in place. Um, the other question that I had, which is what Ms. Hennessy just brought up, was the fees for the um, students who are on free lunch. So I was actually, I didn't know this, but I was surprised to see that there was a fee for students who were on free lunch. So if the rationale is that they are of sufficient need that they can't pay for lunch, why would we be charging them for um, athletics? And then a, a sort of like a follow-up to that is I would not feel comfortable <coughs> myself with an increase for that group. Um, so uh, I don't <coughs> know what the rationale um, for the across the, the um, tiers is. I can tell you that <coughs> as we examined our neighboring districts, oh, good. <laughs> and then you can answer that. As we, as we examined our neighboring districts, it runs the full range from no cost for free and reduced lunch to full cost, regardless of your lunch. Um, so I think that Northampton's schedule overall is probably higher at the full price level and lower than surrounding communities at the reduced and free. Um, but there are a few communities, especially cities, where you know, everyone's free because yeah. everyone's free. <coughs> but Mr. Lombardi, you wanted to address that? No, it's actually a typo. There is no. Oh, sorry? There's actually a typo for the. Um, Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I believe there was a miscommunication when we were talking. Um, we don't currently charge a uh, user fee for free lunch. We do charge a user fee for reduced lunch, and the reduced lunch is 35, 25, 25. I think you just went over the wrong, oh. wrong direction. Oh, okay. I get it. Um, so it's 35, 25, 25. So they get the reduction for the second and third sport, but our our free lunch. Free lunch <coughs> is no cost. Not Thank you. No, I appreciate it. So. I just, before, uh, Mr. Prey. Before yes. you sit down, may I ask a question? Um, in regards to um, um, the current fee schedule and a student who wishes to participate <coughs> in a sport and comes into financial hardship, are there scholarships or are there opportunities, I know in the past, for um, a student still to participate and waive the fee? Um, generally, I just request that their families reach out to me at, or to uh, the principal or vice principal and, and request a waiver. But the Northampton Athletic Booster Club, who has been supporting the athletic department in other ways over the last five years, has also discussed offering um, scholarship options for kids who can't afford to participate in, in sports. So the, the waiver is there if folks ask for it. Um, uh, and then the NABC also helps. So it's not our practice to turn away a student from participating in athletics because of cost? No, it is not. Okay. Mr. Reed. So I also wanted to bow down before our mayor, who has managed to turn what could have been a fiscal mess that I think was supposed to hit us this year and managed through really wise fiscal management, push that trouble farther and farther and farther away and I just am really grateful to how well you've done <coughs> the city finances and also echoing what everybody else said about this is a really well thought out presentation. I love the way you've interacted with staff and <coughs> who take taking their ideas and I just I think it's great across the board. Um, I want to um, try to follow in Ms. Hennessy's footsteps. She was so successful with librarians. I wanted to see if maybe I could, you know, get some of her mojo uh, attached to coaches, um, particularly in some really 
great schools that I've seen a, a literacy coach in every elementary school um, or an instructional coach and um, the there are a lot of ways to do that as I think you probably know that are that are budget neutral um, because they um, reduce PD costs and then I think the other arguments aside from all the benefits they bring to uh, the you know literacy and math improvements that are, have so much impact especially in those lower grades for student success later um, they also as you know our friends Joyce and Showers proved um, through lots of research the um, the coaches um, create transfer of PD so the the workshops that we send our teachers to uh, if there's a coach there to support them in the building uh, all all the time a designated full-time coach then that PD has a much better shot at actually transferring to the classroom and the student so um, so and then it also can reduce PD costs because the coaches can provide PD in the building so um, there are ways that other districts that I've talked to have done this in a uh, revenue neutral way and I just would really encourage you to um, you know look into that and see if there's a way and I just think that would really have a big impact for little or no money so First off, I want to apologize for not admiring all of these beautiful things. <laughs> I was trying to be more businessy. <laughs> there's some so many terrific things, and I want to echo what everybody um, is saying. I want to say it's very exciting to think about the preschool at Leeds um, and what a powerful experience it was to have the preschool at Jackson Street and to also um, be a part of the preschool at Bridge Street School and to think that we could spread that um, to more schools. I think it does make a really cohesive um, experience for our community. So that's really great. I would love to know more about, um, you were talking about cutting costs of professional development, um, which feels very counterintuitive <laughs> as um, a former teacher and a parent. And I would love to sort of understand how that would look and work. So every building has its own professional development funds that are over and above the professional development funds that exist district wide. So those $11,000 are taken in this budget from the individual school cost centers. So for an elementary school, it might be an impact of $2,000. For middle or high school, it might be more like three or four thousand um, dollars, and the so the the impact would be mainly on teachers' ability to go to the conference, you know, to their own individual conferences. So it would be at the elementary school maybe one less of those or two less of those per year. At middle and high school, maybe you know five or half a dozen less of those per year. Okay. So, uh, go ahead, Mr. then. I haven't spoken that much to you, I, I think. Go ahead. Uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, only because it was a follow-up um, to Molly's question. Um, <laughs> In regards to the professional development, if we don't have st if we don't have teachers going out and going to conferences, uh, would we be looking to expand opportunities here in the district? I know we have some really um, highly qualified teachers who have some really dynamic, creative ideas and maybe even in the areas of differentiation as it's one of the uh, concerns that I've been hearing lately um, by parents in the community. Would there be opportunities to keep in-house uh, professional development going? Um, I'm sure it will, but to increase those opportunities at much lower cost as we'd be using our own faculty to run those workshops. So my response to that would be that I think there are some things that we could do. Um, I think right now some of those things are constrained to a certain extent by elements within the collective bargaining agreements. Um, we're entering into collective bargaining and I certainly will share with the committee's negotiating subcommittee some of the ideas we have um, for changes that might be conducive to more in-house teacher professional development, but it's not wise to broadcast negotiating strategy, so I think that's all I'll say about that. Sure. 
Ms. Hennessy? I was actually coughing, but I always have something to say <laughs> if you're going to call on me. <laughs> um, I, I, two things. I do find it sad still that we can't figure out early start, not to bring that up again. And I wish we could figure that out and go back in committees and talk about that, because I do think that that's going to have a benefit in the long run. And the second is I'm, I, I, I'm going to repeat the um, Ryan Road, but I keep, I'm sitting here thinking how I was very moved and sad by that too, and how the schools are, were, were charged with solving all these problems, and that I'm wondering what outreach we can do to have other groups um, come in and with these many different problems that um, our community is facing. And so we're trying to help with one, but what can we do to bring in other resources? I, I want to say this without um, in any way uh, having it reflect to, to diminish anything else that any of the other principals are doing, but I have to say that the amount of outreach work I've seen this year at Ryan Road is beyond, um, beyond anything I've seen. Um, some of it honestly goes beyond what I even think is reasonable or safe. Um, I, I see that, you know, staff are extending themselves in a way that, that goes so far beyond what, what the usual expectation is to try to get um, other resources and other um, services in place for kids on the outside. But the, the problem that I think they come up against, and every other school comes up against as well, is that we're in the context of a state budget that has been slashing human services. Yeah. You know, it's just been, it's just been, you know, in I, at my level now, I don't file many 51As, but I remember <coughs> yeah. when I was in, in a position where I was exposed to many more 51As, the essential question for, from screening was, if we don't respond to this, will the kid perish before the morning? And if the answer is no, they really had to deal with the kids who were in that life and death situation. So, you know, I, I think that all of the schools are really uh, proactive in trying to get um, outside resources involved, and I don't think that Ryan Road has been any less successful. I was than in no, else. no way su even suggesting yeah. that it was their responsibility. I'm merely saying, do, do we, who, us, um, what do we do? Like, do we go to the city council? And and talk and ask for some. I don't. I don't know the answer. And I know that they've been doing great work. It just feels like even that solution of the schools outreaching is still putting the onus on the on the schools to solve the problems. So thank you for You're saying welcome. that. Mr. Baird. So I, um, to bring some levity back after. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I also wanted to just sort of echo something that um, Mr. Reed talked about in terms of the idea of coaches and professional development and some, you know, some different models in sort of the same vein as Ms. Hennessy in terms of maybe next year's budget. Um, so my, my district, of course, is I've talked about is, is get a much more robust funding mechanism, different state. Um, but we do spend very little on outside professional development, very, very little because we do have a math and a reading coach in every elementary school, and I, don't, I know that that's not achievable for us, um, and the middle school, and we have you know, department chairs at the high school, but they're the people we send out for outside PD, and we do a lot of work within the coaching staff just together, professionally learning together, and then we turnkey all that professional development to our staff, and we've had um, some huge success increasing student achievement. We've gone from about 45% of our students at the elementary level in mathematics scoring at the 50th percentile on, we use STAR instead of Ames Web, but we've gone to 65% from doing some pretty intensive professional development. And another thing that's great about setting your coaches out for professional development is there's no sub-cost to that. Um, and often there's some great networks with free professional development for them. Um, so I'm just gonna echo what Mr. Reed said. I think that would be something great for us to look towards. Do you, do you, I'm sorry, but is that a, is it, 
in your in your thinking at all, or if you had experience in other districts with with uh, coaches in elementary schools, or just I'd love to get some some of your thoughts. I've worked in districts that have coaches um, available not only in elementary schools but in other schools. Um, I will say that it's one of the um, things that we looked at in budget discussions this year. Um, the problem, I, I guess, one of the problems that we face is that um, even though we don't have coaches, we also spend very little on outside <laughs> um, professional development. So we, we looked at, you know, if we added it all up and, and sort of took that piece of money, we probably would have enough for a half-time coach. Um, so then we even looked at, well, if you don't do the librarians, well, there are some reductions that are included in the librarian package, so you only get, you know, like 18,000 net out of that. So if you put that together with the other, then you might have the choice of like a .8 coach or 2.4 coaches, one for ELA and one for math, and it just seemed like it was such a little amount that it wouldn't have an impact. Um, but, you know, I, I have seen I have seen coaching models work. You know, obviously the reason we were considering it was because we also have an interest in, you know, seeing how we can tweak our current coaching model. You know, I would say the overall problem with our current coaching model is that te the teachers who have been trained as coaches are not getting out of their classes enough to actually <coughs> do coaching. Um, so it certainly is in our mind. It certainly can be something that, you know, I hope it's not going to be the next thing that haunts me, but maybe it will. <laughs> um, certainly, we, something we can think of in future budgets. And, and just just to follow up there, like for instance, in Adams Cheshire, they um, they were able to uh, create a, a coach in each elementary school by, without any increase in cost by shuffling um, staff. So uh, I, I, I think it is it can be done in a way that doesn't increase the budget. Valid. Um, so I have to be honest this like I dread this time of year because um, I always feel like we're gonna have to make such hard decisions and and this budget is so well done that it actually worries me for a couple of reasons one is you're doing so much more with less money that I don't want us to be complacent and say that it's okay because okay. I imagine what you could do if we were fully funded like if you can do this much with no increase in budget like what could you do I think that it would be amazing. And so I don't want us to get complacent until next budget season. I feel like we need to be more politically active at the state level. I feel like you've done your part and listened to your leaders and your constituents, essentially, and they're not listening to us. And, and I think, in part, maybe we haven't been loud enough. So I would just like to urge the committee as a whole for us to really become a little bit more vocal about our opposition to the funding and to um, the budget in general, and there is still time, theoretically, that that could change, um, because I feel like you're a little bit of a miracle worker, and if we could give you a couple million dollars extra, <laughs> it could be amazing, so. I'd love to show you what I could do with it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Uh, Mr. Zahowski. I would just say, um, in regards to Ms. Fallon's um, comment, in regards to this being a difficult time of year, the budget year, um, to my veteran members <laughs> that have sat on the committee, this is this is actually very palatable, and um, for me, very. I won't call it relaxing, but what I would say is it's refreshing because we always started <coughs> in years gone by in the red. And we never talked about how we could grow the system. We only talked about how we could place tourniquets on mortal wounds and how we could try to limp along and survive um, when we were on life support. Um, but I think what we see here is there's, there's, there's fresh air coming back into the district. There's creative ways of doing things that allow us to continue to extend our stability and sustainability so that when we look at your last slide, we can look at um, 2021. And, and that's not getting complacent saying that um, we know it's not going to eventually be here. But during those years when it's not here, that we continue to find ways to look at what the district as a whole seems to need 
to focus our efforts on those areas to the best that we can and continue to move a great district forward. So I love the plan. I think you did a great job. I think you did it all the right ways by consulting the people that you needed to hear from in order to create this budget. And um, I look forward to seeing it come out in hard copy real soon. Okay. Any other comments or uh, questions for the superintendent? Okay, um, we do not uh, have any new business this evening. Um, future business, obviously we have another school committee coming up. Uh, school committee meeting March 10th at 7.15. Uh, our school committee retreat the following evening, March 11th, uh, 6 p.m. at the Florence Civic Center. Um, and then a school committee meeting on March 24th uh, at 7.15 p.m. I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? The meeting is adjourned.